We have now made it to part 3 of the history of Blue Origin, and in this video we're mainly going to discuss how they went from their test vehicle in 2012 all the way to New Shepard 1 in 2015, including various rocket engines they had to develop, work that they did with other companies in the aerospace industry, and some controversy that came up between Blue Origin and NASA. So let's talk about that. So now that we're in part 3 of the history of Blue Origin, we're looking at the 2012 to 2015 time frame of the company. And if you haven't seen the first two parts, I highly recommend you go back and check those out just to get a better understanding of where the company is at this point. But to continue on, the company had just finished up working on their Propulsion Module 2 rocket as well as their crew capsule, and they are trying to implement these together to create the New Shepard or the first iteration of New Shepard. Now in order to upgrade Propulsion Module 2 to the new Shepard vehicle, they would need to design a new rocket engine yet again. And in fact, they had been working on Blue Engine 3 over the course of the last three years at this time. In fact, in January of 2013 is when the company officially announced that they were developing this engine. Now BE-3 is a pump-fed bipropellant rocket engine, and in part 2 of the history of Blue Origin, we discussed a little bit about what a pump-fed rocket means, and in fact it basically just means it uses a turbine to pull the two propellants into the combustion chamber rather than using a separate gas. Now in this case, the propellant isn't kerosene as it was in BE-2. In fact, they're using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and the reason for using liquid hydrogen is it's much more efficient and in fact what the space shuttle main engine used. In addition, it's a lot easier for it to be reused, however there are a lot of challenges that come with using hydrogen. One of the biggest challenges is that it has to be kept at such a cold temperature in order for hydrogen to be in its liquid state. More specifically, it has to be kept at negative 252 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's really cold. In fact, it's so cold that they use the liquid hydrogen as coolant for the nozzle of the rocket engine, meaning that they can actually cool down their rocket nozzle using the propellant that they're about to burn, which is pretty fascinating. Now BE-3 would be implemented into the new Shepard launch vehicle, so not only do they need to make a stronger rocket engine, but they also need to make one that can throttle down and perform successful landings. In fact, BE-3 has a maximum thrust of 490 kilonewtons, which is much larger than what BE-1 and BE-2 were capable combined, and in fact BE-3 is capable of throttling all the way down to 89 kilonewtons, which is really impressive in terms of the range that it's able to throttle to. Now the first test of the BE-3 rocket engine would take place on October of 2012, and in fact this was a few months prior to the official announcement of the rocket engine, and then it wouldn't be until the end of 2013 where they would perform a full duration suborbital engine test, basically burning the rocket for the entirety of the expected time frame that it would take in order for New Shepard to reach suborbital flight. Now as you see in the video right now, this is actually the full duration test of BE-3, and usually some of the earlier testing for an engine will only last for a few seconds, mainly to get data on the operation of the engine so that they can improve it for later development and research in the topic. However, once an engine is reaching the end of its development phase, that's when they start to perform these full duration tests to make it more effective and more representative of what the actual flight is going to be like. Now also in 2013, NASA was looking to lease out Launchpad 39A, and if you aren't familiar with this Launchpad, this is actually where all the Apollo missions launched from going to the moon, many space shuttle missions, and actually the US National Registry of Historic Places considers this one of the most historic places for the aerospace industry, mainly because it's a main place for exploration. So as NASA is leasing this out, since it had been a few years since the last space shuttle mission, that means that many aerospace companies were looking for this as a pathway for their future, basically being attractive to both Blue Origin and SpaceX. But some of the controversy between Blue Origin and NASA comes up when Blue Origin actually files a protest to the US General Accounting Office saying that NASA was exclusively selecting an offer for SpaceX. Now if we look at the bigger picture at this time frame, SpaceX was actually finishing up their grasshopper testing, which was their reusability and vertical landing of large boosters. Therefore, Blue Origin might have saw this as a threat to their potential vertical landing capabilities in the future. So whether this was a jab to 
try and slow SpaceX down in their development, or if they thoroughly thought that NASA was selectively choosing SpaceX, we will really never know the answer to that. But ultimately, this decision came a couple months later saying that yes, SpaceX would receive a 20 year lease with the ability to use Launchpad 39A. However, in response, SpaceX came out around that time frame saying that they would be willing to work on a multi-user arrangement if there were multiple companies that wanted to use the Launchpad. However, at this point right now, Blue Origin doesn't have the capability to use that Launchpad. So we'll see where that goes in the future. Now we've made it into 2014 and throughout the year, Blue Origin worked on their new Shepard launch vehicle. And in fact, there are a couple updates. In July of 2014, Jeff Bezos said that he had put $500 million up until this point in the company, so over the last 14 years. And in September of 2014, ULA, or United Launch Alliance, announced that they would be working with Blue Origin on BE4, or Blue Engine Number 4. And basically, this would be to help them in the development of their Vulcan launch vehicle that ULA had been developing. Now to give you a backstory on ULA really quickly, as of right now, they have the Atlas V, the Delta IV, and the Delta IV Heavy launch vehicles. And in fact, there's been some political controversy around the Atlas V, mainly because it uses Russian-made rocket engines. Mainly, this is just a political issue. However, for their next launch vehicle that they're developing, the Vulcan, they don't want to have that problem. So this is one of the reasons why ULA looked out to Blue Origin, because they wanted to see, okay, maybe we should look more towards the United States-made rocket engines. But let's talk about BE4 a little bit. It is actually ran off of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Now liquid methane is actually made up of one carbon and four hydrogen atoms and is somewhat similar to SpaceX's Raptor engine that is trying to do the same thing. Now I'm not going to compare the engines specifically right now, but mainly one of the good things about using methane is that when you're combusting it, it doesn't leave as much carbon residue on the engine. Therefore, it's really great for reusability. In addition, as we mentioned earlier, hydrogen has to be kept at really cold temperatures and methane doesn't have to be kept as cool. Therefore, it's pretty effective for reusable systems, which is why both SpaceX and Blue Origin are looking at these for their reusable rocket engines. Now, because of this implementation of liquid methane, it is predicted that BE-4 will be able to run upwards of 25 times, including takeoff and landing. In addition, BE-4 is actually a staged combustion rocket engine. And this is really fascinating because it takes the propellant, the liquid oxygen and liquid methane and actually runs it through a pre-burner or initial combustion stage. And this is actually what runs the turbine or the turbo pump in the pump fed aspect of the rocket engine. But it doesn't combust it all the way. In fact, it only does a little bit. Therefore, the exhaust continues out into the main combustion chamber, which then combusts again and creates the main thrust. Now, the stage combustion technique is pretty rare when you compare it to other rocket engines on the market. However, Blue Origin must have saw this as being pretty efficient for what they wanted to perform. And in fact, BE-4 is actually capable of reaching a maximum thrust of 2,400 kilonewtons. Now we have made it into 2015, where the company had 400 employees, which is 150 more that they had in 2012. And to continue at this point in time, they had finished the development of New Shepard 1. And New Shepard would be 18 meters tall, would have a crew capsule that could fit a maximum of six people on board, and was powered by only one BE-3 engine. And the very first flight of New Shepard 1 would take place on April 29th of 2015. So let's see what happened. So the vehicle took off successfully and the BE-3 engine burned for a little over a minute and a half. The crew capsule was separated from the propulsion module or the main booster and it reached a maximum altitude of 93 kilometers, which is just beneath the Kármán line which is at 100 kilometers. Now pause. The Kármán line is basically the place where the atmosphere stops and space begins. And this is basically calculated by the fact you'd have to be going faster than orbital velocity to create enough lift to stay up at this altitude. Therefore, the Kármán line is basically saying you're in space. Now, if we go back to the video, the crew capsule came back down and landed successfully, but the propulsion module or the main booster had issues with the hydraulic system, which ultimately led to its crash. 
Now both Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin saw this as a pretty big success for the company. Even though the propulsion module did in fact crash, they said they are already working on a new hydraulic system. And this is also the point where we see the company starting to be more public about what they envision for the future. Now if you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to this channel to learn more about various methods and rocket science in space. But in the next part of this series, we're going to go all the way up to modern day Blue Origin. We're going to discuss the new Shepard 2, new Shepard 3, what impressive things they've been able to do with their abort sequence, and also what rockets they envision for their future. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.